Lonely Monk Productions. Yo, That's My John is brought to you by Liquid IV. Guys, it is festival season. And you know me, I love a festival. And the secret to enjoying a festival is to stay hydrated. Liquid IV has you covered while you prep before, power through to the headliner, and recover after the weekend. Liquid IV hydrates two times faster than water alone with three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks. Man, I love Liquid IV. It comes in a convenient packaging, and it's tasty. When you see me at the Exponential Music Festival this fall, you know that I will have Liquid IV on me. And it comes in 12 delicious, refreshing flavors to keep your hydration routine exciting. All right, strawberry used to be my favorite, but they have this new one. It's strawberry lemonade, and it is a banger. One stick of liquid IV in 16 ounces of water hydrates you two times faster and more efficiently than water alone. It's non-GMO and free from gluten, dairy, and soy. Liquid IV believes that equitable access to clean and abundant water is the foundation of a healthier world. So Liquid IV partners with leading organizations for innovative solutions to help communities protect both their water and their futures. To date, Liquid IV has donated over 39 million servings in 50-plus countries around the world. Okay, and you can get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use the promo code YTMJ at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order when you shop Better Hydration today using the promo code YTMJ at liquidiv.com. Do it, and let's get our fests on. I don't know if y'all have heard Act Natural by Margaret Glasby yet, but yo. That's my joy. That's my joy. Hey, yo, displace the guilt. What's good, friends and family, neighbors near and far? Welcome to an all-new episode of the Yo, That's My John podcast. The podcast, website, brand, movement, way of life dedicated to the embrace and championing of your passions. I am your host, Nate Runkle, a.k.a. Senior Trip, Paris, that cafe. I love that waiter. John Luke, a.k.a. Nate 3.0, back at it again with yet another episode of the podcast. As always, I hope this podcast finds you all in good health and in good spirits. On today's episode, I am joined by Jefferson Berry for a great conversation about his new album, Prairie Fire, and his history in radio and as a teacher, and we talk about gun control and so much more. And that is coming up in a bit. But first, gang, how have you been? You know, like I warned you a few weeks ago, this summer schedule is wonky, and I apologize for the disruption and not having new episodes for you to dine on, but guess what? I have got a bunch in the can for you to have a bountiful feast. And while I can't guarantee there won't be no more disruptions, that's a horrible sentence, I am also a realist, and I know that there very well may be. So that being said, I have a bunch of episodes already backed up and recorded. So for the next few weeks, expect to have some episodes waiting for you on Monday mornings. But my friends, do not mistake my absence for laziness. I have been a busy bee and buzz buzz. And I'm going to share with you some of what I've been up to. All right, coming next month, you know, that super secret project I mentioned a few episodes ago? Well, it's finally going to be launched. I've been producing an actual play D&D podcast entitled Oops All Bards. And If you can't gather by the title, it's a campaign of six bards thrust from their graduation from Bard College into an adventure. Host and DM Jill Ivy weaves a tale of intrigue and hilarity as the cast of bards must find a way to save the land from the return of an autocrat long thought dead. Oops All Bards will be available on all major podcast apps next month, so be on the lookout for that. 
You know, and I also recorded a guest appearance on the Single Season Record Podcast, hosted by my pals Derek Armijo and Brian Strang. The show examines TV shows that only lasted one season, and so far they've tackled shows like Wonderfalls and Bunheads and Swan's Crossing, Father of the Pride, The Pits, and Drive. And my episode? It's a one-shot as we discuss the one-season, one-episode, 1984 hip-hop classic, Graffiti Rock. It was such a fun conversation, and I was so excited to get the chance to guest on their pod. And then, finally... My appearance of Risk is already getting a re-release as part of the Black Lives series this coming Thursday, June 22nd, alongside stories by Darylise Lyons and Tori Weston. It's an absolute honor to be part of such a tremendous show and collection of tales. The whole experience has been amazing, and I was totally blown away to hear it's already being re-released. And, you know, well, of course, the best way to stay on top of all the news that's fit to print is to sign on up for the mailing list. Head on over to www.yothatsmyjohn.com, fill out that form, and be prepared to receive pure excellence emailed straight into your inbox. And look, I don't have to tell you because I'm sure you've done it already, but if you haven't, go ahead and follow us on the socials at Yo That's My John. We're chasing socials like Pokemon, man. We gotta catch them all. You know, we even got that sweet, sweet blue sky up and running. So go, go follow it. All right, we're going to take a quick ad break to pay the bills. Then we return with my interview with Jefferson Berry. Y'all, quit being boring just eating dinner and watching TV every night. Next time, pull out a Wongo puzzle and enjoy the conversation and fun that happens when people puzzle together. Wongo is the perfect balance of a good challenge without being so hard that you stop talking to each other and leave your family forever. Trust me, once you try Wongo, you will never go back to a boring old jigsaw puzzle. They are 100% wooden puzzles that will last forever. Each piece is hand-drawn, so no two pieces are the same, and you'll discover some fun, whimsy pieces as you work through it. They come in a custom wooden box, which is perfect for storage and gifting. And they have so many cool designs like African elephant and the wild lizard and the sea tortoise. With stunning designs and unique shapes, Wongo puzzles are a cut above the rest. Now, I like doing the snow globe puzzle myself. It was so great to pull out a puzzle and be done in a night and not have it on the table for a week. So what are you waiting for? Go to wongopuzzles.com and pick your puzzle today. And be sure to use the promo code YTMJ to get 10% off your offer. This is the most fun you've had with a puzzle guaranteed or your money back. Go to wongopuzzles.com and use the code YTMJ to get 10% off your order and get puzzling right now. That's wongopuzzles.com. Offer code YTMJ. Hey man, do you want to make a podcast? Well, Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily and then distribute it everywhere and get this, even earn money. All in one place, for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. And then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. And when you want to take your conversations with your fans to the next level, Q&As and polls are the best way to get them talking. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, this is totally free with no catch. 
Ever since I discovered Spotify for podcasters, I have been able to release this little hobby of mine to the world with very little effort whatsoever. They do all of the hard, unfun stuff. I just get to do the fun stuff. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. That's www.spotify.com slash podcasters. My guest today is a singer, songwriter, and leader of the Urban Acoustic Coalition. His latest album, Prairie Fire, is an 11-song journey through the storytelling tradition of urban folk. He will be celebrating the album's release with a show this Thursday, June 22nd, at The Living Room in Ardmore, PA. Folks, it is my honor to welcome to the show, Jefferson Berry. Ladies and gentlemen, I am joined today by the great Jess- Jefferson Berry. Jefferson, thank you for joining me today on Yo, That's My John. It's so good to be with you, Nate. I'm so excited to talk to you. Uh, we kind of spoke about it just before, but I- I've been I've been trying to set something up between the two of us to have this conversation for quite some time, so I'm glad we're finally getting to have it. Ah, uh, it's about time. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, uh, not too late. But uh, uh, I wish it were sooner. But uh, but we did it. We we finally uh, achieved the goal. Um, I, the new album uh, Prairie Fire is absolutely phenomenal, and I can't wait to talk to you about it. But before we even get started, let's uh, tell these folks a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in Southern California. Um, my parents moved out there in 1967 when the revolution was all a flutter, and. Um, so I became this little hippie hiking up and down the, the West Coast. And um, I graduated uh, high school and then finished uh, college at the University of Santa Cruz. Uh, I'm a banana slug. <laughs> so, and um, so, uh, and then uh, I, you know, got to my radio career. I was uh, in the radio business for about 30 years. And, um, you know, do it selling rock and roll radio to advertisers and promoters. And, um, and that, you know, um, I got sick of that and became a high school teacher when I moved back to Philadelphia. But in between there, I, I had a, uh, I had an ad agency. I consulted Howard Stern stations around the country. Um, you know, a lot of different experiences with, uh, with creatives and, and different folks, and um, and then I became a high school teacher, inner city high school teacher for twelve years. So, I'm living a living a sort of a curious, uh, curious life here. Yeah, you've worn you've worn yourself some uh, many hats, many hats. Um, when you were a kid, like what what was what kind of music was playing around the house? What were your folks into? Well, my folks were listening. My mom listened to a lot of Peter Paul and Mary, and. The uh, uh, most happy fella in Oklahoma and things like that. Uh, Mozart. My mom was a big Mozart fan, but they didn't listen to any of the, you know, the pop music of that thing or or bebop or any things that should have been popular when they were, you know, lively teenagers. Which indicates my parents weren't really lively teenagers. <laughs> so. But yeah, we come on to um, we come on to the Beatles like everybody else. Um, February 9th, nineteen sixty four. You know, uh, the Ed Sullivan Show, and um, man, that that just changed my world. What like uh, what what exact? I mean, obviously the greatest band of all time. But what what exactly was it for you that kind of clicked? What excited you the most about it when you first saw it? John Lennon hitting the point and just banging out tunes while the girls were screaming. I just said, I looked at that and I said, oh, yeah, I want to do that. So, and I was, you know, I was young and everybody, his mother was trying to play all those songs and and picked up my brother's guitar. And um, and then we moved west. We moved west in 1967. And, uh, you know, all kinds of new music was, was happening out on the west coast that we weren't really listening to. On cousin Brucey WABC <laughs> back east, so 
but um yeah so the music the music back east uh, music out west was uh you know and radio was just so alive but they got bump and people had bumper stickers on the car with radio station call letters that represented their their lifestyle right this is who i am i am KLS, klos los angeles you know and uh or krqr uh or kroq los angeles you know modern rock hard rock you know and um or met i mean or you know khj the hit radio station you were what you listened to and that that identity was something like it was important it was important to people well, um, so you're 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 taking in all of this music, and you said you were fooling around on your brother's guitar. Were you starting to play at all, or were you starting to like play out? Uh, well, you know, in 1967, I'm 12, so okay. I'm not really playing out. I'm just learning stuff and learning stuff like you know, down on the beach, there'll be a couple of guitars, and one guy will have figured out, I don't know, George Harrison something, and he'll show you the chords. And so you little, steal a little bit of this here and a little bit of that there. And, you know, 50 years later, I've stolen a lot of music from a lot of people, you know, so that, but that early, early days is a, you know, a really important part of it. Yeah. Um, so did you, did you immediately um, at that time kind of come up with the idea of going into radio and kind of working with radio stations and stuff like that? Was that kind of the goal? I, I, no, I really, really um uh there's a lot of a lot of us was involved with back then that I shouldn't have not have been involved with so I mean you know drug sex and rock and roll and uh so finally you know once I got out of once I got out of college and um you know finished my stint as a migrant farm worker in the Central Valley I mean I I had to do something a little more I don't know, substantial. So I became became a, a sales representative for a pots and pans company. And somebody said, listen, and I was at that time out of college, I'm playing the LA club circuit, but I mean, there's all kinds of people out there, you know, like Van Halen's happening. Um, the Knack is, is happening in LA, big LA bands. And I recognized that I was not, I mean, I was not going to be that, I wasn't going to be that successful. I was not going to be that good. Um, but I could get close to the music. And, um, you know, so I took that that sales experience and got a job selling rock and roll radio up in San Francisco. Uh, what station? And basically it all just happened one day. I just said, look, I'm going to uh, KMEL San Francisco, the beast of the bay, the camel. They had this camel shooting through the O of the 106. They had a big inflatable camel, you know, that they would put out by the freeway. I mean, the, the promotion on this the station was just, I mean, it was outrageous. And basically, they gave me no accounts. They gave me a phone book to go talk to people about, you know, rock and roll music. And this is, this is a good place to advertise. And I went and talked to, you know, drag strips, motorcycle dealers, nightclubs, you know, an 18 hour day where you show up with a suit and tie during the day and then you go out and party all night in, in nightclubs and, and get their advertising money. It was ridiculous. It was like a, a party that never ended. That's incredible. But, you know, and I, and I got to hang out with, you know, Eddie Money and Journey and, you know, various different folks doing various different projects and having a lot of fun. The um, So how long were you at that station for? I was at Camel for three years. And then I went to the Rock of the 80s station called The Quake. Um, and uh, I got to work with Alex Bennett at both of those radio stations, a big time morning uh, DJ. And um, and then, uh, you, you know, I st started making babies with a, a, a wife back there. My oldest daughter was born in San Francisco. And then, but to get credentials in the radio business, I sort of thought that I should go back east. And so I got a job for a couple months with WAPP New York, come down to WISP in Philadelphia, 
who switched over to the Howard Stern station pretty quickly. We were the first Howard Stern simulcast. So, and with that going on, you know, I went up to Brooklyn and I spoke with Eddie Antar at Crazy Eddie, and I brought Crazy Eddie to Philadelphia. Oh, you're that with, was that was your fault. <laughs> yeah, that was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> he's insane <laughs> those those uh commercials it was really obnoxious and the thing is like we could we couldn't find enough we couldn't find enough airtime to sell him he would buy anything that you know was <laughs> sold it was it was preposterous those... so but still so close so close to the music so close to the nightclub action you know and the station was doing promoters with the hooters I, t- I sold a, a sponsorship for Live Aid. I got to hang out backstage for Live Aid in 85. And uh, just having, you know, crazy being that close to it. And yet creatively, you know, uh, the the music part of it wasn't really kicking in at, at anymore. I mean, I'm playing, you know, like everybody else, but it's very amateurish. Yeah, well, that was going to be my 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 next question was like, so you know, uh, concurrent to this, like, uh, were you writing music at this time, or were you still? Just I am, kind of- I am a little bit, but it's kind of like you know, developing songwriting skills over a period of time. You know, like at this point, if you go, uh, I have about fifty songs produced on Spotify that are that are really very high level. Um, this is Jefferson Berry on Spotify. It's got, you know, the stuff I'm really proud of. But then there's another, you know, 50, 60 songs that were written over a period of 20, 30 years that are, uh, you know, I mean, they're expressive. You know, I'm learning, uh, I'm developing chops while I'm doing it. Um, I'm learning different uh, genres of, you know, the blues coming out of a, a folk background. That was in my house with, you know, the the Peter, Paul and Mary stuff that my mom was listening to. I had those kind of harmonies to sort of built into my DNA. Um, you know, coming from California, I also had a lot of Grateful Dead and Spirit and the psychedelic music, you know, flowing through stuff. Um, somewhere along the line, you know, I'm picking up on uh, John Lee Hooker and the whole line of, of blue stuff. Lee Michaels comes to mind. Um, so a lot of these influences are there. Elvis Costello was a big one. Uh, you know, that and listening to Elvis Costello or Bob Dylan write songs gives you sort of uh something to model after. And I've tended to go towards that that um that style of songwriting that tells stories. You don't have to be the best singer or the best guitar player in the world if you have an interesting story. Yeah, and you definitely have like some incredible stories. Like I think, like you, 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 the storytelling aspect of your songs is is such an incredible strength um, that you have because you paint these, you know, in, in, in these vivid uh, pictures. And and so, were you always were, were you always drawn to kind of storytelling songs, um, or did that, like you just said, you know, listening to Dylan and and Elvis Costello, did you kind of uh, gravitate towards it eventually? I guess it's a synthesis of that style of music as well as having a passion for uh, William Faulkner or, or Steinbeck or Hemingway and, and seeing how that they weave stories um, and create characters and, 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 and create scenes and, and um, scenery to put that kind of stuff on a musical basis is um or a musical platform is kind of like where where I'm coming from. Yeah, definitely. No, no, that that that, de- that developed over quite a long time. Yeah. Um re- rewinding into the the radio, uh how did you get out of radio? Like uh was was it a conscious decision or was it just um, you know, the the end of radio of what we know and it becoming Yeah, it was a very conscious decision there the risk I wrote, I wrote a check for uh, my daughter's uh, high college uh, tuition in 2009 as the recession was just about to hit. And I, I wrote that check. And then I walked into my boss at CBS and I say, I quit. I'm going to become a high school teacher. And he looked at me like I had three heads. You're not going to become a high school teacher. 
And, uh, oh, yeah, because, I, I mean, I'm done with you. I mean, and it was like what happened there in the economy and what happened in radio at that point was just like, I miss it, but what I miss isn't there anymore, right? The bean counters had taken um, radio off into a space where you're really not delivering results for, for nightclubs or or you know, motorcycle dealers. When I first started, I could write a commercial for a motorcycle dealer and I would make him a lot of money that weekend. I was in service to somebody. You don't think of advertising as being service oriented, but that's what business people do. They try to promote their business and try to make some money. And if you can help them do that, you're of service to them. Well, it became something else and radio stations started to run i mean well you know from your own experience listening to radio man they're running like you know 25 commercials uh an hour 25 minutes of uh, an hour i mean you, you can't take in that kind of information so i knew radio was dying i saw a recession coming on i always wanted to teach a little history and so that's what i did Oh, it's incredible. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, just another, uh, fascinating kind of bookmark in, in, in your, um, many hats. Um, you know, I, I think not just becoming a teacher, but, but teaching, you know, in the city, uh, to, you know, um, uh, 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 people that, uh, or, you know, a community that, that people tend to kind of overlook or want to avoid, um, is just admirable. I, I find it, I find it absolutely yeah. fascinating. Well, it's also about this time I started a band called Hippies and Hillbillies. <laughs> I had a band called Hippies and Hillbillies, which is sort of like Jerry Garcia goes to Texas. And that had, that had you know, with a banjo, mandolin, and bass. And that was the beginning of, of my urban acoustic roots, although we were playing hillbilly music for the most part. Um, the idea that you could put out a quasi-rock product with banjos and mandolins and now also with harmonicas and lap steel not necessarily you know marshall stacks and you know that kind of thing um we've that that's the roots of of the music was with artists like robert earl keen and um uh ray wiley hubbard and you know texas kind texas kind of rock so, but I quit. I, I quit the. I quit the job then, and I'll go off and get my uh, my uh, teaching credentials, and uh, and uh, started teaching in the inner city. Uh, how much of that, like, informed uh, kind of the storytelling uh, that you wanted to tell uh, in your in your songwriting, uh, working, you know, at the schools? A, a lot, absolutely, a lot. And when we would do, we would have. Uh, I taught African American history to African Americans. What we would do uh, every Tuesday was Black Music Tuesday, and everybody would bring in their their tunes that you know that they we would study songwriting and we would study the roots of different kinds of songwriting from slave haulers to you know the blues and the jazz and how that all moved up the Mississippi River from New Orleans to the Black Renaissance into the origins of hip hop. And um, so they would, they would come back to me with all kinds of, of stuff that I was not familiar with. And it was, you know, you can pack a lot of words in some of that, that hip hop stuff. So, I mean, I learned how that kind of songwriting was happening. And at that time I ran into this guy, Samir Woods, who was one of my students. And, uh, you could totally see that this guy had a magnetism about him that just wouldn't quit. Uh, he had a focus. Now, he was a clown. I mean, he you didn't want him in your class necessarily because lessons got disrupted with him just about every day. But you could see that he was focused. And I, I was the um, uh, faculty advisor for the school talent show, and I had him MC it. And, uh, you know, went off big. Now, you got, I got dozens of kids like that, but this guy became a little Uzi. And I mean, so later, like that little Uzi is happening all over the world, but I didn't even know it was Samir Woods. I didn't put the connection to, together. So one day, um, so one day when my, uh, 
my principal, I guess my principal of the head of school, somebody came to me with a hip hop magazine and they've, they're interviewing little Uzi and little Uzi says, you know, when I was getting my high school diploma in, uh, in Philadelphia, I had a teacher told me, if you want a real job, you got to keep the tattoos off your face. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing he did when he graduated he got a bunch of tattoos on his face because he didn't want a real job <laughs> and he got it too. my principal was going well you must have told him this right and um i did I, you know you know if you want to if you want to get a job with a, a, a company that runs plumbing trucks out there a tattoo on your face doesn't help you get that job it just doesn't <laughs> So but he's been fabulously successful. On the other hand, the other guy, uh, Run Up Rico, uh, man, he was on his way. Uh, he was on his way up. And uh, the stuff he was doing, the stuff he was doing in high school might have been more impressive than what Samir was doing. Uh, of course, the kind of the production that uh, Little Lucy has had and his video production has been groundbreaking. Um, and, you know, even coming from the kind of acoustic rock place that I'm coming from, you, you take a look at what he's doing and, and you have to be impressed. Um, it's incredible. Good people behind him. Yeah. It's absolutely I incredible. Hope, I just hope that he learned from me. That, uh, yeah. I just hope he learned from me that he needs to pay his taxes. <laughs> <laughs> I told I talked I talked them all about that in government class too. You know, I taught them about taxes and investments and so but he seems to be doing great. But uh Ron Prico, not so much. He was murdered. Yeah, it's a shame. Uh, it's uh, absolutely a shame what happened there. And so many of my young students uh you know have been. I mean, it's really like, like it was several funerals a, a year for twelve years. And that's like that's that's part of like what I find um, so admirable is because like that's something that to like can very easily break you, and um um and 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 yet you know you you continue to to teach and to educate, and um and it's just uh, uh like absolutely amazing and 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 I'm sure there are uh, a lot of people who thank you um for that you know. You know, it's it doesn't happen so much now after COVID, and now that I've been away from uh, teaching for a while and, and playing music full time for the last couple of years. But before that, yeah, I would get stopped two or three times a week by former students because I had a couple thousand of them. I, two or three a week might be a, a bit of an exaggeration. Two or three a month would stop me and say, "Yo, Mister Barry, you know that stuff you told me about? I don't know, buying a house or whatever." I would not have come up with that on my own. And, uh, you know, this is my wife. This is my kids. I'm, I'm a $80,000 a year plumber. <laughs> Good. I'm so glad to hear you're making twice what I am teaching. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, really you know, honest, I mean, yeah. setting them off on that path and then they see you and they say, man, that guy gave me the information that I was sorely missing. And uh, touching the future like that, I mean, you really can't, you can't replace it. And I, and I miss that as well. But that kind of situation post-COVID doesn't really exist that much anymore either. COVID changed a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, being being kind of there on uh, in that ground level and stuff and, and, and with the way, you know, um, especially um, post-COVID, just kind of the the... I don't like using the word powder keg, but like just the, the, the state of, of kind of, uh, the, the youth in Philadelphia and just, you know, how many people have been left behind and how many people like, you know, uh, uh, turn to so much that they just cannot avoid, um, and, and the, you know, horrible outcomes from it. Like, do you, do you see, you know, having, having been there and talked to people and families, do you see like a, a, a solution? Do you see like kind of a light at the end of the tunnel or, or something to, uh, yeah, clearly you're not going to, one person can't fix everything, but you know, is there anything you think that, that could change things? I see a solution to the deep poverty in Philadelphia. I think that was the question. Yes. Um, 
I'm of the school of thought that a good job helps a lot of things and that you get a good job uh, through, uh, you know, training um, that should be free to everybody. But navigate, navigating this complicated society is just like, it's kind of nutty, you know? I mean, it's really hard to figure out on your own, especially if you're not, you know, modeling on something you've seen or heard or done. And when everybody you know and generation after generation um, is in this situation where you're living hand to mouth, you don't know anything else. Yeah. You see, I mean, and this is this is the allure of the drug business. You know, you see people out there, you know, making lots of money and and uh, but truthfully, they're you know, it's a puff of smoke. It's an illusion. And most of those guys are living with their moms, you know. So, uh, a good job, you know, and understanding that. I think the uh, financial education, um, you know, fin- financial literacy. Uh, is something that everybody should have a whole lot more of in that community. Um, also, you know, I'm a big advocate of uh, gun control. I have a, a video called Blocks and Guns. I just got a, another recognition from the London Music Video uh, F- Film Festival, which just came in today. I'm pretty happy about it. But, you know, the idea there's so many guns out there they have to you really need to just like make uh, gun control a situation where if if you don't if you don't need a gun you shouldn't have one yeah i i mean i'm i'm a, i'm uh um uh kind of a a weird absolutist in that um uh you know people are like well the second amendment blah 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 and i'm like i i, I i'm all for uh, and, and i don't know why i would say this out loud on the podcast but i'm all for like okay then uh, uh, revise the second amendment like it, the, i'm i'm of the belief that like you know we we got to a certain point where um we no longer will make changes to um a document that was meant to be changed and we now treat the constitution as bible and 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 it and it wasn't always this way you know it's only been what 40 years or something like that 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 we you know 40 or 50 years that we've kind of um changed the the idea and the concept of the the constitution to make it this infallible untouchable thing and i just don't think that's true like i i and i don't know how you fix that yeah, well, actually, the Second Amendment calls for a well-regulated militia. Yeah. So, and even in the decision that that uh, made took militia sort of out of the equation, they said, you know, we government should still regulate, should regulate gun ownership, and if we had a database of crazies and felons uh, along with every gun in America, and you mix those two databases and take guns away from the crazies, <laughs> it's like, yeah. That and, and the places where that's been done, where that kind of database technology and enforcement has taken place, the level of violence has been reduced radically. The thing is, is in these communities with these folks, you know, that you have to you have to think that the people calling the shots don't care if they're shot. If they're shooting one another, you know, that's exactly so, right. And you know the other. The I've, other been, I've, ta- okay. I've talked to kids about their needs needs for guns, and yeah, Mister Barry, I got to be strapped up, you know, because everybody else is. And I go, look, I'm not going to get shot because I don't carry a gun. You don't have to worry about me shooting you before you shoot me. Yeah, I don't know. And then you know, well, no, Mister Barry, actually, you're not going to get shot because you're white. <laughs> it's like, of course. I mean, that has something to do with it too. I'm not going to deny that. But that conversation with that kid, you know, I'm still thinking about it. Really promising um, football player, full scholarship to Oklahoma or Ohio State or something like that. I have a conversation about the Second Amendment. Two weeks later, he's, you know, somebody shoots him in the head. Jesus. Yeah, I mean, right. So you can't you can't really make that stuff up. And I know this is like kind of off the music track, but when you're experiencing life. Um, at a variety of levels, at the street level, 
at the academic level, wherever you're really experiencing life, you get inspired to tell some pretty wild stories. I have a song on a double deadbolt logic called Shattered Glass. This was really influenced by my kids because it's about stealing cars. <laughs> they knew all about stealing cars. <laughs> you know, like how to, you go, Mr. Berry, you, you got to look for the 2009 and below Hondas and Toyotas because those are the cars that you can strip the steering column wires and, and hot wire them. Anything after that, it becomes really hard. And I go, okay. And then, and then what do you do? Well, you know, the parts on the Honda Accord, you can find a Honda Accord 2009 or before. Those parts are still pretty good, right? So, yeah, and there's, a you know, two or three different uh, strip shops that we go to. It's wild. <laughs> really? It's wild. And how much money do you get for that? Hey, you're four or five hundred dollars, Mr. Barry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, but, you know, like you said, you know, it's, it's hard to argue it because there's no alternative. There's no like sustainable job or kind of training um, uh, for vocation like that. Correct. Yeah. Correct. It, you know, it's, it's <laughs> the, the world. I hate this. And then you think, then you go, I'm going to, I'm going to be an NBA star. Oh, good. And, and today after school, you're going to go home and, and shoot a hundred foul shots. 100 foul shots, are you kidding me? I go, you're not going to the NBA, right. okay? If you're not willing there to put in the work, then you're not doing that. She goes, Seth, Samir Woods, I mean, I got to tell you, man, that guy was writing all the time, all the time. He was writing in high school and apparently afterwards, always writing, always coming up with bars, you know? And, you know, that's what you got to do to be that kind of good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so you know, um, at what point did you kind of um, de- start to actually record stuff? So, like twenty twenty, you mentioned um, double deadbolt logic. Um, what what was kind of the lead up to uh, laying that down? Well, I put together this really good band, and you can go out and you can play shows, and but they really they really dug the music. So we go into the studio, and the kind of stuff that I'd done before was, you know, we would record stuff live more or less and not take advantage of any of the, the digital assets that, you, that Pro Tools gives you, right? And we started producing records and songs that, that are really, like, you know, tight. Uh, because everybody's got a job, you can get tight in a couple of different ways. You can get tight uh, by rehearsing two or three nights a week for six months. But I got, got the guys in my band. I mean, you know, they work. We all worked. We are all working in, in 2020. You don't have that kind of time. So when I would go in, I would lay down the tracks for the songs and I would get them as close to a click as possible. And then bring in the drummer behind that, you know, to play to something that's really, you know, uh, locked in along with the bass player. And then we bring in the instruments, we bring in the singers. And that's kind of, we came up with a formula for, for producing songs. Not the cheapest way to do it, not the quickest way to do it, but damn, I mean, the, they sound so much better than the live recordings that, you know, most people in my position are doing. Yeah, yeah. And Double Dead Boat Logic was the first of those records. We had a couple records before that, but they were done, you know, more or less live. And uh so Double Dead Boat Logic, Soon, and now Prairie Fire are all produced in, in, in this way that really in the studio, getting things really like locked in. Yeah. And well, the, the, the results the are part of that is once you, once you produce songs like that, and you, you, that's what the band rehearses to. And now you can go out and, and, and knock those tunes out like that, too. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, how, did, was that like your pod, uh, during the pandemic? Cause you know, clearly you've been putting an album out a year, so you were definitely working and, and working in that way, I, I'm guessing lend itself well, to, to be able to still operate. Right. Well, Double Dead Bull Logic came out, um, in, uh, and that's a really, that's a very school influenced record. There's a lot of songs on there that are influenced by my my working with, with, you know, inner city teens, then, but that came out like on March 7th, 2020. 
<laughs> I mean, I mean, the whole world shut down. I had this whole, I had tours set up. I had a lot of promotion and, you know, lined up for it and it died, you know, because yeah. you know, it died like a million Americans died. And yeah. So, um, so then a couple of years later, you know, along the same lines, we're still, what else are you going to do, but record and make, write songs and, and it soon came out and that got us, you know, it's got some nice festival jobs off of that. And now, now Prairie Fire is like, uh, in the same mode. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, in between, in between there, you did your acoustic solo, um, dreams of modern living. Like, uh, you're, 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 you're making, it's like you're making up for lost time. Cause you are, you are very prolific. <laughs> yeah. We're doing a lot of stuff. You know, Prairie Fire and uh, Dreams of Modern Living were kind of produced at the same time um, as we waited for, uh, you know, different parts to come together. Um, my banjo, lap steel, electric guitar player really needed, he wasn't operating in the studio like he wanted to. He wanted to do stuff in his own studio. So... Yeah, Prairie Fire actually took like a year and a half to do. And in the meantime, I was said, listen, I've got to get some more product out. And that's why I did the solo record. The solo, it's kind of like a folk record, actually, because it's just me and a guitar. Um, yeah. I really like, I really love playing in a band, though. Yeah. I mean, just play, playing solo. And I do a lot because, you know, the you, you have gigs that won't pay for a whole band. You know, so it's nice filling up the schedule with with solo shots. But this Prayer Fire album is just, you know, again, Bud Burroughs on on uh, keyboards and mandolin. Uh, Marky B is the best harmonica player in Philadelphia, in my opinion. Um, got a new uh, a new drummer on this record, uh, Adam Schoenberg. Uh and my guy, Uncle Mike, uh, I mean, Uncle Mike and I, we hang out all the time playing. Um, so, you know, that's the band. And Dave Brown, Dave Brown plays just about everything under the sun. And then we bring in various people to, you know, fill out the coalition. It's sort of like, yeah, I have a bass band, but it's a coalition of the best players in, in Philadelphia. Uh, this record's got Emily Drinker on it. Uh, I don't know. Have you interviewed her yet? I haven't interviewed her. Uh, we have. We we we're in a Discord uh, channel uh, 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 server together, and uh, I definitely want to get her on this show because I was going to ask you about that. Like, um, you know, bringing her in. What was what was working with Emily like? Because she's just a phenomenal voice. She's a phenomenal voice, and she's so intuitive. Um, and in the studio, you can say, "Listen, why don't you do this?" And, and there's not a lot of singers you can say try this out and then she knocks it out the first time and my problem with my band i really i need a lead singer singing backup but the thing is lead singers they don't want to sing backup right. and emily drinker geez the band that she's got the band she's got that she fronts it's phenomenal they're great you know, why would you want to sing backup for me when you could be leading your own thing <laughs> Now, not to mention that she's, you know, she's, you know, dar she's a darling, right? You know, she's easily 40 years younger than me. And, you know, <laughs> you know, so she's got her thing. They've got I Irene Lambro spent some time with the band and uh, she's got, you know, going to be she sits in with us from time to time. And she's the lead singer in this band, Medea. And um, I saw them a little couple of weeks ago oh my gosh they're tremendous again why would you sing back up for jefferson when you could be on the point for a really really good band so that happens um you know i had a band for a while with my daughter brianna berry a band called the berries it also had bud burrows in it um and uh but we decided that uh that uh singer guitar player was encroaching on the relationship of father daughter so oh yeah yeah is it, mean, is it is it is it hard you you were saying uh try it this way is it hard uh, to say try it this way to your daughter or uh oh there's no telling her yeah 
No, and, and she was the point. She was not. I, I mean, I was the backup singer in that band. I mean, I'm sort of I'm producing it, but I mean, she she was the point person, and really, you know, she the music business is not for everybody, and it certainly wasn't for her. So she decided that, you know, she'd rather, you know, go off on her own, own stuff. And she's married a jazz piano player who we all adore. Uh, he, he's the best musician in the family now. Um, so, yeah. No, so, but anyway, the, the, the getting people in, I've got Kenny Lancey on saxophone on a couple of cuts on this album. And he's just, and he's so intuitive. He just, on soprano sax, it's just like, his tone is, it's its just flawless. And you there again, you say, hey, try this. And, you know, I might sit down at the piano and, and run a line by him. I don't know if I did that with him or not, but, you know, giving him, you know, a certain amount of direction in certain parts of the song. He understands what you're saying right away. You're talking the same language. He executed it. And, uh, you know, the song, You Could Do Anything, it's kind of my favorite song on the record yeah my um uh if, if we're talking favorites here i gotta tell you my favorite song on the record is a circus song and it's there's a very specific reason why and it's because like um it it it, it just uh, kind of fills me with the same kind of joy that um, all of that material that Harry Nielsen wrote for the Popeye sound for the Robert Altman Popeye soundtrack. It fills me with that same kind of like just like just that that feeling of like I would like to sit somewhere possibly drunk and sing along to this song. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that song is written by Michael Spear, and that's another one of the tenets of Jefferson Berry and the UAC is we're a part of a, a, a songwriting community. And what I don't think Philadelphians do enough, I don't think we cover one another's songs enough. And so on every record, I try to try to do, a, in this case, it was a Michael Spear song, but, you know, on Double Deb, uh, on a Dreams of Modern Living, I covered a Ben Arnold song. Um, and getting uh, getting these songs that, other friends have written covering your friends um i think is is kind of important and michael spear i mean that's a great story i mean that's just a great story yeah not, the, and not necessarily one i would have come up with and it sits on the last song on side a of the vinyl when it comes out and um yeah i'm so happy he lent that to me it's it's great. It's great. And you do like a phenomenal job with it. You just you, you knock it out of the park. Um, you, but you know, that idea of like um, covering friends and covering, um, you know, Philly musicians and stuff like that. I'm right there with you. Like, uh, I, you know, I, I, I had like a small singer songwriter uh, background. And one of my favorite things was learning how to play like a song that somebody else I opened for or somebody else I was playing with. I mean, I just did it recently. I don't know if you're familiar with the Tisberries, but I just put it up on my on on, yes. on, on uh, um, Facebook and Instagram uh, recently, but I, I did a cover of their uh, "On the Run" in Harmony, New Jersey, on a banjo lele, just because like that song gets stuck in my head. And I, but like, give you know, taking these songs and just like kind of putting your your love on them to just kind of pay your respect to them, like, it's a beautiful thing, and I, I think it's an awesome thing to do. Well, and the thing is, for the people that wrote the song, and then they hear your arrangement of it. Um, Michael Spears arrangement of that song. When I first took that song over, now what's on the album is this calliope kind of keyboard thing that Bud Burroughs came up with. But my first arrangement is I kind of turned it into a John Prine song, mm. which was very, you know, very different than what we ended up with. But uh, yeah, I mean, when you're doing that for other songwriters, man, that that's that's as flattering as anything could possibly be. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we got the uh, the uh, album release show coming up uh, uh, on the 22nd uh, of this month of June. Um, be and, Thursday. Yeah. And, and you were just telling me something about uh, you're doing a movie there. Is that is that the urban acoustic yes. movie? Yes. Yes. It's the uh, Americana Philadelphia, the urban acoustic movie. And basically, it's uh, following sort of the format of The Last Waltz by Scorsese, 
um, where we're interviewing people about the in a documentary style. Uh, we're interviewing pe people about the local Philadelphia Americana scene. Um, there's two sort of sets of interviews. There's people that are a real key part of the scene. Uh, you know, much like yourself, we'd love to interview you for this. Oh, my um, God, I would and love they've to. Come in, yeah, yeah. We'll come in and people are just talking about uh, what's happening in, in Americana in Philadelphia, what things have changed. I have Megan Carey coming in, and we, we cover one of her songs. She's had success in New York and Philadelphia. What's the difference with Americana music in the two different markets? Um, and we're going to have John Colgan Davis, who has uh, had uh, the Dukes of Destiny, this is the longest running blues band in Philadelphia. You know, what, what's, what has changed over time and how does blues sit in the Americana scene? Um, uh, Jesse Lundy is uh, a booking agent in Philadelphia. Um, and, you know, where does Americana sit in the local club scene? So a variety of people are going to come in on camera and do that. And then I'm going to have people coming in as the as the ticket holders come in, and I'm going to interview them too. And they say, what clubs do you like hanging out at? You know? Um, who, who What bands do you like going to see? You know? How often are you going out? And when all that film is done, in between there, after we have those interviews done, the band's going to knock out a couple of sets. And uh, we've been rehearsing the daylight side of this thing. And I have a bunch of people coming in and sitting in with us, you know, who aren't necessarily in the band, but they're part of the scene and they're going to play. Um, and then when it's all said and done, I'm going to have uh, in, within a month here, because I need I need to submit it to uh, to premiere at the I want to have premiere at the local film festival. But we're going to end up with a documentary that I think is going to be interesting. And if not, if nothing else, we're going to, we're going to have a bunch of great music videos. Yeah. Of the performances. Well, you know, so, like, yeah, Americana Philadelphia. I mean, we're really trying to, trying to put ourselves in the middle of it all. That's awesome. Like, and, and even like, like you said, even if, you know, nothing really comes of it, you, you will have, and it's based, it's, it's right there in the, in the word documentary, but you'll have this beautiful document of like a reflection of, of this kind of scene that, that, that we have here, which I think is just, it's, it's always been a really nice scene, but I, I feel like in the past, like 10 years or so, like it's just become such a, uh, not just good music coming out of it, but, a, but a good support. Like, I, I feel like, you know, egos are, are gone and everyone wants to help everybody else. And it's just been, it's been really tremendous to kind of watch what it's kind of grown into, you know, at this time. Truly. Yep. Um, so, so, uh, that's this Thursday at the, uh, living room in Ardmore, right? Correct. Um, have, you, have you, you played that room? If you haven't been to that venue, it, she's got, uh, Laura Mann, who's been on the scene for a long time. Uh, she's running the place and the place is filled with couches and, and really comfortable chairs and stuff. And, uh, she's really made a nice, nice place to see a show. I haven't made it out there yet, but uh, uh, my pal Andy King plays there, uh, uh, you know, usually once or twice a year. And I'm, I'm, I keep missing these shows, but I definitely have to get out there. Cool. Um, hey, you want to go you want to go through my jauntlet questionnaire? These are my questions that yes. I ask every guest on this podcast. Uh, you know, uh, being go. being a Philly guy, you know, that John can mean whatever you want it to mean. So when that occurs, you can, it doesn't have to be music. It can be anything. But the first section is the one hit wonders. And the first one, Billy Joel or Elton John? Uh, I cover a, a Billy Joel. I cover an Elton John song on um, a Dreams of Modern Living. So I would have to go with Elton there. All right. All right. Uh, Debbie Harry or Joan Jett? Joan Jett. Yeah. Um, working working in the um, uh, uh, radio market and kind of her being an area person, have you ever um, uh, met uh, Joan Jett or, or uh, worked any with her? We did. We did. We did. Uh, we did uh, uh, a Joan Jett show at the uh, Chestnut Cabaret um, back in the day. And she was a sweetheart. I mean, she was really like you see people like her who don't really have to be nice to everybody and frequently stars like that aren't um but yeah no she was 
you know, she would use your name, look at your, look you in the eye and excuse herself to go take care of something else. I mean, she was polite and, and wonderful. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. That's incredible. Uh, next one, Aretha Franklin or the recently and sadly late Tina Turner. I mean, that's yeah. That's a, there's only one answer to that aretha franklin yeah <laughs> yeah um nirvana or pearl jam well that's an interesting question i think there's really probably one answer to that too uh, i mean nirvana was so groundbreaking and i'll tell you a little little story about where the punchline was nirvana i was in in london and i saw this band called thunder they were opening for Aerosmith at one of these 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 pop festivals that London is absolutely you know, a million of them. And I never heard this band before. And I was in like in rock radio for a long time. And they're clearly in that mode. And I asked the, the guy next to me, he goes, this band here, they've been around for a long time. Oh, 20, 20 years ago. And um, how come they never made it in America? And he, he looks at me in one word, Nirvana. Mm, mm-hmm. That big hair, hard rock thing stopped like hitting a brick wall when Nirvana came on. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I've often said um, uh, uh, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, Kurt Cobain to me killed the um, flamboyant guitar solo. And uh, I'll, I'll never forgive him for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. And, he, and no, he did. And you know, to Pearl Jam, to, to, to give them their due, I mean, the, the 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 amount of time that they've had, you know, at the top of American consciousness is like no small thing. It's it's hard to stay on top of things for that long. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Janis Joplin or Stevie Nicks? Janis Joplin. All right, yeah. all right. Uh, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this one, but uh, Beatles or the Stones? Beatles. Yeah. Yeah. I thought Although. So. The Rolling Stones, man, are great bad. I mean, yeah, of like, course. You can't, and people back in the day, maybe 1965, you were comparing the Beatles and the Stones, but not now. You yeah. can't compare them now. I mean, <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, the last one of the one here wonders Bohemian Rhapsody or Stairway to Heaven? Uh, I used to be a short order cook and I would sing Bohemian Rhapsody while I was clipping burgers. Awesome. I love it. I love it. I can play I can play Stairway to Heaven on the guitar, but I think you're a fool if you ever try to sing it. Yeah, it's definitely true. That is definitely yeah. true. Uh the last uh, the second section is the uh top ten countdown. Like I said, John can be whatever you want. If you want it to be music, it can be music, or if you want it to be anything else. But uh number one, what was your first John? What was the first thing you were obsessed with when you were a kid? February ninth, nineteen sixty four. The yeah. Beatles. On, yeah. a, on the Ed Sullivan show. I mean, life that, changing. That, life changing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any uh, thoughts on, uh, I don't know if you saw this news that came out yesterday, but Paul McCartney says they used AI to um, generate uh, another Beatles song um, that they're working on to be able to set, they used it to separate John's vocals from a demo um, uh, from his guitar playing. So there's new Beatles stuff coming out. It doesn't feel right, I, does it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a, a philosophical question or is a rock and roll question? Yeah, it's a I philosophical guess. question. It's, it's it's horrendous, obviously. But hey, you know what? The the song could be good. People will listen to it. I mean, that's where things are going. It'll be amazing if they chart you, too, because it'll add another another decade to their uh, ability to chart. Can you even imagine? <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, number two, what was your first concert? What was, or I'm sorry, number two is what's your current John? What are you into right now? I skipped one. <laughs> what am I currently into right now? Um, I'm into vinyl. Yeah. I Me like too. listening to all the old vinyl stuff and the remastered white album on vinyl is absolutely stunning. You can hear. You can hear the drums like you never heard them before. You can hear Ringo, Ringo's changes. Um, you can hear the imperfections in some of it. Um, Steely Dan on vinyl. Yeah. So we have going back back to the old stuff. So that that's that's the current John. I love it. I love it. Uh, number three, as I jumped the gun and said already, what was your first concert? 
1968, uh, my parents took us to see Simon and Garfunkel at the Hollywood Bowl. And they were like, you know, I am a rock and the sounds of silence and all that. It was just an amazing performance. And I have since heard a recording of that show. And it's as good as I remembered it. I was asking my dad at 12, Dad, what's that smell? (laughs) (laughs) And what did he say? <laughs> I don't, you know, it was a funny kind of cigarette, I think. Uh-huh. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Sure it is. <laughs> uh, number four, what was the last concert you went to? The last concert I went to was Medea at the yeah. living room. Yeah. Very yeah, cool. Irene, Irene Lambro's band is, they're so good. Oh, my gosh. I got to check them out. I, uh, I, I haven't, I haven't heard them. So like I, um, number five, what was your favorite concert? My favorite concert. You know, I have been thinking about this and I, at a certain point wrote down a list of all the concerts because being in rock radio, I saw a whole lot of shows. Um, 1971, this one just keeps coming back to me because it was so impactful. We went from Portland, Oregon, where I was going to school at the time, up to Seattle to see Bob Dylan's comeback. He had just, like, he was recording uh, uh, Blood on the Tracks, and his backup band was The Band. The band laid down, you know, a set, a 12-song set of their hits, and then Bob Dylan hit the stage with something to prove because this was a comeback situation for him. And uh, that was a really mind boggling show. I mean, I, I keep coming back to it as being, I mean, if you had to pick one show out of a hundred, um, that, that was, that was it. What got me to thinking about what was the best show though was about two years ago, I saw Steely Dan do Asia at the Metro Oh my God, that was so good. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I really like tight production. I like it when people are playing really complicated parts and not making any mistakes. And they, they you know, those, those Steely Dan songs are they're very hard. They're very hard. And you have an 11 piece band, you know, up there doing that and really not, not missing at all. I mean, it's just very, very impressive. So. It's awesome. Awesome. Two very awesome answers to that, by the way. But I but I also I also lost saw Led Zeppelin uh, do the Led Zeppelin three tour. So you gotta say that that's in the top five as well. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh yeah, I guess you can't discredit that. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh number six, and this might actually be a challenge with as many shows as you've been to because of the the radio stuff. Who have you never seen live that you wish you would have? They can be living or dead. Queen. Yeah, never saw Queen. And oh, I'm a huge man. Queen fan. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. yeah. Bri- Brian May is the uh, reason why I play guitar, and um, Freddie Mercury. I just bow in the uh, presence of greatness of a front man. Like just incredible. The greatest, the great, the greatest rock singer of all time, without without a without a close second. Very much so. I mean, you Very can look at so. a lot of bands. And there's a lot of good hard rock guitar players out there. Brian May is astounding, but there's no singers like uh, like Freddie. 100% agree. Uh, number seven, name an unappreciated John. Name something you wish had a little more uh, uh, attention to it. Um, what needs a little bit more attention? I think I would like to go local with this. And I just don't understand why Ben Arnold is in a national treasure. The guy's like, he's been the best singer songwriter in Philadelphia for the last 20 years, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, I don't know. And, I, and his records are just tremendous. Yeah. So why isn't he ha- a household name in America? It's so weird. You know, he was um, he was my first um, be, uh, what I felt it, 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 to me, like my first big get on this podcast um, was getting to pick his brain because like I feel the same exact way. Like he is without a doubt somebody who um, should be a household name. And and it's 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 perplexing to me that like um, 
uh, that that it just never really like blew up for him, you know? Right. He and I used to work together. Oh yeah. He was a uh, yeah. He was he was a copywriter at at my ad agency. And one day he walked in and he said, "I've told this story a million times." I, I he walked in one day. He said, "I'm quitting this job." I go, "Really? Where are you going to go work? It's as cool as this." He goes, "I'm going to be a rock star," and he had signed to Columbia Records, and um, you know, and they put it on the shelf. They let him on, and uh, so and he, he's put out like a dozen really good independent records since. But yeah, and not not yeah. just the solo he, stuff, but like the um, the U.S. Rail stuff, and like yeah, he's just absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, number eight. What's your uh, favorite album? See, I and mean, I saw this on the list, and gosh, there's so many good ones. Um, my favorite album is Pretzel Logic. Yeah. Steely yeah, Dan, Steely Dan. Yeah, the the you, you can't that. go wrong with the dance. You can't go wrong with the dance at all. <laughs> no, no. And it's only it gives you pretzel logic only because I probably listen to Asia too much. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and Katie lied. I mean, yeah, so. yeah. There, the, I mean, just yeah. three three perfect albums, like just absolutely perfect. For the Royal Scam. Oh yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. Crazy. Um, number nine, name an artist whose output you'll consume anything they put out. Say that again? An name, artist that... You'll consume anything they put out. So sight unseen, uh, you'll just um, Im- immediately like a day one purchase. Yeah, John Mayer. Yeah? Yeah. Because he's, I mean, he's really the best guitar player on the scene right now. I mean, it's hard to say he's the best guitar player, but... His production and songwriting and guitar playing, you know, there there might be a few songs on the record that don't really connect with you, but there's always always four or five that do. Um, so I'd have to say anything he puts out, I'm, I pretty much buy. No, yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I was. It's so weird because um, uh, I think it was. It might have even been this morning on XPN. I heard uh, "No Such Thing" for the first time in forever, and that was the first song I had ever heard by him. And I remember, like, I was in college, and it came on MTV or VH1, and I was on my way out the door, and it started playing, and it stopped me in my tracks, and I had to turn around and like watch the entire video to figure out who this guy was. And uh, right. I've, you know, I've been a fan ever since. Like, like uh, um, e- through through the the highs and the lows of you know his uh, personal oh, life, well, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, these a lot of these cats are operating at, at you know at a level of celebrity that's only barely survivable. You it's know? true, and to sort to sort out that kind of attention and not be a, a complete knucklehead, well, he has failed at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he most certainly is a complete knucklehead, <laughs> but gosh, the music's just great. It's so good, and that stuff he does with the trio, um, with you know, with like Pino Palladino on bass, is just like my god. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, the tenth and final question of the top ten countdown: What is your favorite John of all time? Can be anything you want it to be. My favorite John of all time. I have a relationship with my daughters that's just something else. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. It's a gift gift that just keeps on giving. You know, when when you bring kids into the world, you watch this, this, these little minds develop, you know, and then as they grow older and they become adults and they start running the world, you're just, it's just awe inspiring. You know, there's nothing quite like that. I'm not in love with my wife, but I have to say my favorite John is my kids. Ah, oh, it's a beautiful answer. Beautiful answer. And I'm sure your wife will understand. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, before I let you go, I do have to ask you one thing, all right? Um, so, you know, as a um, published and cited historian um, uh, with uh, Colonial PA history, um, do you know the story about George Washington and General Howell's dog? General Howell's dog. God, I do know this story, but I'm not calling it up. 
Okay, tell, so tell me, so, tell me. so um, from what I've heard, and uh, this is what I want to ask you. From what I heard, um, uh, shortly after the Battle of Germantown, um, both encampments were kind of um, close by, and General Howe's dog got out and ended up um, in Washington's encampment. And um, Washington's people wanted to, like, um, send a message and, like, you know, kill the dog or something and send it back. And Washington um, uh, had the, uh, had Hamilton uh, pen a uh, ceasefire so that he could return General Howe's dog to him. OK, now here's what I want to ask you. All right. And, and the, the documentation does exist. The, the letter of the ceasefire to hand this off did occur. OK, mm-hmm. um, in the middle of all of that bloodshed. Right. <laughs> they ceasefire over a dog. Is that not right. the perfect description of how insane America is? <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty much, <laughs> pretty much. And, and particularly when you consider that at that point, you know, Washington is executing guerrilla warfare and they're just they're 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 killing they're killing British soldiers in ways that British soldiers had never been killed before. Like just out of nowhere, like from behind a tree, from popping off a few of them and then disappearing um, to stop to have a ceasefire among that kind of warfare i mean can you see the Viet Cong doing that right to gis no no that's a pure american deal it's so weird and it's something that like the ever since the the first time i heard about it i was like it can't be true and then i started like researching and i was like oh my god the, this is the yeah. most insane thing in the world <laughs> that's the thing uh, yeah i i i when i ran across it too i said that's like that's like legend yeah, that's not, you know, you know, but no, that it did it happen. It's crazy. Um, so the album Prairie Fire is out on all the streaming services, and you said there's vinyl. There's is is the vinyl available now? We have we have we have the wax. We haven't pressed it yet because I'm still I'm still like got, actually this is the first time this ever happened. We have vinyl on uh, the last two records, and so I want to keep that going. But really, it's about what the actual product looks like. Um, we're we're sort of in coming up with revisions on the the album cover. Okay, the album's completely done. Yeah, it's ready to press. I need a cover. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, it's good. No, it's good. Like I think, and and it 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 definitely lends itself to um you know it being your current John being vinyl. You you respect that that vinyl is something special, and 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 that shows. Well, and yeah, I mean it. It's it is. It's it's just like you walk into a room that's playing a, a real record. You know, the it's got a warmth to it that that's like nothing else. Yeah, how how's how's it how's this album sound on vinyl? Because I bet it just sounds absolutely beautiful. I haven't I haven't got the test pressings yet. Oh, yeah, I haven't got I the te- oh, okay. I haven't got the test pressings yet because I haven't given them artwork. <laughs> oh man, that's crazy! Oh, it's so crazy! Well, All right, well, eventually, but, and yeah, I'll... no, it's, it's gonna be it's gonna be here soon, and then then we'll have a big whoop de do uh, album release in the fall when we do that. Okay. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I can't wait. I want to get my hands on that because uh, I, too, am a vinyl addict. <laughs> nice. Nice. All right. So uh, this Thursday, uh, June 22nd at the Living Room in Armour, you can catch uh, Jefferson for the CD release or, or the CD release party, right? Or just album release in yeah, general. The CD uh, release. Uh, yeah. Out, we're calling an album release. Actually, I put when I put out CDs now, I have a QR code on it on the album cover that so you're really just helping me out by buying the cd that actually what you need is a qr code which takes you to my website for to link up with spotify apple music title soundcloud Bandcamp. other band camp is band on there I, I was on that yeah, today band camp. yeah so you can like buy all my stuff Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you so much for doing this, Jefferson. And and thank you not just for uh, uh, coming on here, but for all of the music you create and um, all of the lives you have touched um, as a teacher. I I, I say this as earnestly as I can, that um, I I find that so incredibly admirable. Um, uh, And uh, I thank you for uh, spending some time with me today. 
Hey, Nate, thanks for having me on, man. I, I don't get to riff like this hardly ever, right? <laughs> My thanks again to Jefferson for joining me on the show today. You can find more out about Jefferson by visiting his website, www.jeffersonberry.com. His latest album, Prairie Fire, is available now on all major streaming sites and available for purchase on his Bandcamp page at jeffersonberrytheuac.bandcamp.com. And you can join Jefferson to celebrate the album's release at his show this Thursday, June 22nd at the Living Room in Ardmore, PA. Links to all of those are in the show notes. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to like and subscribe to the Yo! That's My John podcast wherever you get your podcast from. And guys, it's not too late to get yourself a super awesome John Scout merit badge for Citizenship of the World just by rating and reviewing us. Don't forget to visit www.yothatsmyjohn.com for articles, merchandise, and links to all of the previous episodes of this podcast. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for our mailing list to get all of the updates delivered straight into your inbox. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash yo that's my john for updates and live streams. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Yo That's My John and search Yo That's My John on YouTube to find the Yo That's My John YouTube channel. We got uh, some live videos up there right now from the Nicole Atkins show, one of her doing Maybe Tonight and one of Tommy Stinson. So check that out. Like and subscribe the heck out of that ish. We want to hear from you. Reach out, reach out and touch some John. Well, that's all I got for you this week. Join me next Monday for another big episode where I get to chat with two of my comedic idols. Is that vague enough for you? Blue skies. Until next time, everybody. Hey, yo, displace the guilt and embrace the pleasure. Your taste in music doesn't have to be. Yo, That's My John is a Lonely Monk production written and produced by yours truly, Nate Runkle. Theme song by Phil Tyler Music featuring Nate 3.0. Special thanks to Fox Run Brands, DX Ferris, Andrew Scott, Natalie Runkle, and the incredibly brilliant and wickedly stunning Katie Daubney. If you or anyone you know has any ideas they would like to share or any guests they would like to hear on the podcast, please feel free to reach out to us at yo that's my john at gmail.com. Or you can leave an audio message for us and possibly hear yourself on a future episode by visiting anchor.fm slash ytmj slash message. Until next time, be sure to displace the guilt and embrace the pleasure and shout to the world, yo, that's my John. Yo, that's my John.